You are listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I'd love to talk about books with anyone and everyone. While listening to my podcast, you will hear author interviews, behind-the-scenes conversations about various aspects of the publishing world, theme discussions with other book lovers, and more. For more book recommendations and a complete list of all of my interviews, check out my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Thoughts From a Page. In 2022, I would love for you to join my Patreon group. I offer at least two bonus episodes a month and a monthly advanced read and pre-publication author chat. For those on Facebook, I host a special Patreon Facebook group where we all chat books. Thanks so much to those who already participate, and I hope you will consider joining us. Today, I am chatting with George Dawes Green about the Kingdoms of Savannah. George is the founder of The Moth, and he's also an internationally celebrated author. His first novel, The Caveman's Valentine, won the Edgar Award and became a motion picture starring Samuel L. Jackson. The Juror was an international bestseller in more than 20 languages and was the basis for the movie starring Demi Moore and Alec Baldwin. Green grew up in Georgia and now lives in Brooklyn, New York. I hope you enjoy our conversation. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words, a podcast that presents the unvarnished, unsanitized truth of what we have asked of those who defend this nation. As a country, we need these stories more than ever. Stories from Americans who have borne the battle, including 30-year-old remastered interviews with veterans from World War I recounting their time in the trenches of Europe, and with veterans from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and from our most recent conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other battlefields Americans may never have heard of. Hear their stories by listening to Warriors in Their Own Words wherever you find podcasts. Welcome, George. How are you today? I am great. Everything's. I'm here in Brooklyn, and it's um, a little, a little moist today, and a little hot. But really, it's a beautiful summer day. I'm in Houston, and I bet it is a lot hotter here than it is there. I think it is. We've actually had the most glorious weather for the last week. It's really been like we we had a little bit of June in July, so that is great. That is great. My daughter goes to school in New York City, and I just love visiting her. It's such a fun city. Sometimes it's it's fabulous. I am still in love with it after all these years. Well, I loved your book, and I can't wait to talk about it. What I usually ask authors to do is give me a quick synopsis as we start out for those that won't have read it yet. So can you give me a quick summary of The Kingdoms of Savannah, please? Well, very quickly, it's the story of a matriarch in Savannah, a doyen of Savannah society, Morgana Musgrove, who uh, discovers that after her husband dies, she finds that he he has left her little businesses. A lot of uh, the wealthy folks in Savannah just have all sorts of little businesses that they accumulate over the years. And one of his businesses is a detective agency. And she's approached by uh, a rather interesting client who offers her a tremendous amount of money if she will work for him. He's clearly guilty, and he's uh, a horrible toad of a man who's despised throughout Savannah. But for various reasons, she takes the case and then inveigles her large dysfunctional family, uh, her children and grandchildren, all of whom despise her um, and are also in awe of her. Um, But she inveigles them to help her in this case. And so it's a story of a big dysfunctional family in society, and it's a story also of the character of the city. And you're an eighth-generation Savannian, is that correct? Yes, I am. Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah. My great, 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 great grandfather, his house is still there on uh, Habersham Street and this old colonial house that he built. I didn't grow up in Savannah when I was a little boy. Um, My dad was moving from weekly newspaper to weekly newspaper and we were bouncing around 
towns in in the north um, for years. And so we didn't come down to Georgia till I was 11 years old when my mother, who was the real Georgian, insisted that she had to come home. And so uh, we went to Brunswick, which is about an hour south of Savannah. But my mom's always considered Savannah to be our capital city. And when I was a little boy, she'd put on a big hat and we'd get into the big old Chevrolet Bel Air and slowly troll up the coast to Savannah and then meet with a bunch of cousins. My mother was named Inez and all the cousins seemed to be named Inez. <laughs> and they all spent their time remembering big Inez, who, who was the matriarch of the family from generations before. And so we'd sit in these very stuffy rooms and have tea and tell stories of memoirs of nobility that sort of drove me crazy. Um, and so when I was 15, I, I dropped out of high school and I hitchhiked to New York and I started hitchhiking around the country. And I thought that the South was behind me, but it still kind of held this spell for me. So some years later, I came back to Savannah and decided it was my capital city for better or worse. And did you live there for a while before you moved to Brooklyn, or have you just visited and spent time there that way? No, I've, I, I lived in Savannah um, for many years, and I'd sort of go back and forth between Savannah and Brooklyn. Just a couple of years ago, finally sold the house in Savannah. Uh, I had a big old Victorian house, and I finally thought, well, I just didn't want to take care of it and have to rent it out, and it's easier for me to come down and stay in you know, Airbnbs, or actually stay with some of my cousins. All named Inez, right? Yeah, <laughs> all named Inez. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about the inspiration for your story. Obviously, Savannah is an inspiration, but what else? I mean, was there an inspiration for Morgana and her family? I know the mystery inspiration, and I guess we have to be kind of careful talking about it because there are no spoilers, but just tell me how you decided to write this book and how all the ideas came to you. Gosh, there are so many threads that all came together for this book. It really did depend on years of just accumulating research into Savannah, into the culture of Savannah. Um, I, I had so many friends in Savannah. I spent hours and hours in the Georgia Historical Society just just reading about, about a city in which some of the stories come down through the generations happily, and a lot of stories just don't make it. And there are amazing Savannah stories that seem to be never told. And so I, I really wanted to tell them. But I, I just recently at, at the Moth, I told the story, sort of the Ur story of, of Morgana. When I was 19, I was back in, in Brunswick, Georgia, working at a crisis hotline. And I was getting calls from various people who were having crises of different kinds. They were all older people. They were very troubled. They were country people. They were uh, just just amazing, but different kinds of people. And so, you know, it's kind of a long story, and I won't tell all of it, but I just want to say that I finally discovered that all of these people were actually one person. Oh, one 17-year-old girl lived in just a, a little tiny town in South Georgia called Surrency, which is really just a couple of, you know, there are a couple of blinking lights in town, and that's about it. There's a holiness church and a Pentecostal church and a gas station. And there she had grown up, and she was just bored to death, so she had created these characters and created these voices. And, you know, after the crisis hotline period, I, I never saw this girl again, but I'd always wondered what had happened to her. And somehow or another, I kept sort of wondering about her. And then I created the character of a Savannah Doyen, who is clearly old money Savannah, but we begin to understand as the book goes on that she has another past. And she's really based on that girl, who I call Tara in my moth story, but that's not her real name. 
But you know what I'm hoping is that if the moth story goes on the radio next month, that the original Tara might approach me. This has happened sometimes when I tell moth stories, you know, it goes all around the country and then somebody will say, well, I know this, this original person because I would love to see her again. It's just amazing because Georgia is filled with these original, fascinating people who don't really have the opportunity to become artists. Tara, I never imagined she had the opportunity to leave Surinze. That happened a long time ago. I mean, a young woman today who was that original could get out, but in those days you couldn't get out. Absolutely, yeah. So anyway, I have imagined her as the Ur story of Morgana Musgrove. So a couple of things about that. One, let's talk a little bit about The Moth really quickly. It's the 25th anniversary, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about The Moth and what it is and how you started it. And then after that, I want to hear more about how you figured out that Tara was the person calling in as all of those other people. Okay. Well, first, I will say that The Moth, um, I did start it 25 years ago in my living room in Manhattan. It was just after the just after the juror got published and it had been very successful and I was sort of looking around for another project, but I had been thinking about this for years, the idea of bringing folks together just to tell stories was sort of the rule that the stories wouldn't be interrupted. The problem in New York is that there are all these conversation vultures at those parties in New York. And so just as you're starting some story, you're three sentence in, sentences in, and you get interrupted. And I, I, I just wanted to create a space where the true raconteurs that I knew were in New York City could tell their stories. So I had the first moth 25 years ago, June 6th, 1997, and in my living room. And we had, I just I just was lucky to have lots of really interesting friends. And so then we went, we started to go out to bars um, because I need to get folks out of my living room. But uh, the moth just took off right away. I, I, You know, it's amazing that there had never really been a venue like that. And once it began, once people began to think about the idea of gathering people to hear stories, just personal unscripted stories, the kind of stories that people have always told, you know, in in their kitchens um, or, or around campfires. But to just bring folks together and tell those stories on a stage had never been done before, but it was suddenly just everybody wanted to do it. And now there are really moths or moth clones in every major capital of the world. And you know, the radio show is a huge success and we have millions and millions of podcast downloads every month. And and I think we're in officially, and I, I forget the count now, about 30 cities around the country. And it's just, it's just become an amazing phenomenon. I think that's such a wonderful idea. I love hearing stories. And I think that it's fascinating that you decided to do that. And then obviously it was very well received if it's all over the place and you've got so many downloads and Everybody else must love to hear stories as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, everybody loves stories. If they're well told, I remember the one of the great inspirations for The Moth was listening, um, I think it was 82, I was listening to the Dick Cavett show, and Richard Burton came on, and Cavett uh, had begun to do this new thing, which I just thought was, you know, incredibly bold of him. He would just let people go. All of the talk show hosts before then, you know, they were always interrupting and there were little corny jokes and so forth. But Cavett thought if somebody was telling a story, just let that storyteller go. And so Burton tells a story that I think lasts about 14 or 15 minutes about returning to his little town in Wales. And that that show had such a profound effect on me because the story is absolutely riveting. And by the way, it's, you know, you can find it on, on YouTube. Just look up Cavett and, and, uh, Dick Cavett and Richard Burton. And that had sort of gotten into my head and, um, and, you know, just a bunch of things like that. But when stories are beautiful, when there's a, a, a true raconteur, they can sweep you away in, 
in a in a way that no other art form can. So when we have great storytellers, when Edgar Oliver tells one of his classic stories on the moth, or what, when Edgar Oliver comes on tour with me and we're out in the middle of nowhere and an audience, you know, you can't hear a pin drop. People will time their breathing so that they don't miss a word. It's really a, um, a supernatural experience. It is. And I think some people are born with that gift of being storytellers and others aren't at all. Yeah, true. And there's also, yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up. Cause I also think, <laughs> no, cause I also think there are lots and lots of terrible storytellers. There are. <laughs> so that's why sometimes you're like, okay, just move along. I really don't need to keep it so quiet that a pin could drop because the story <laughs> should just be wrapped up. It's wonderful that you're finding the good storytellers, so uh, not to knock on the others. <laughs> well, I'm dying to hear about Tara and how you found out that it was one person. Well, that story will be on the Moth Radio soon, and I guess you'll hear all the details. I kind of feel like I don't, I don't want to spoil that because it's okay. really, yeah, it's really a kind of a complex story of how I was, of how Tara finally came clean, and it was really a a breathtaking moment for me because I recognized that Tara, who never read a book um, and only seemed to be interested in, you know, the TV shows that she could get out there in Cernsey, Georgia, but it, that she had a, a, a rich imagination, much richer, I thought, than my own and a much better grasp at Southern characters. And she kind of taught me what Southern characters were. I didn't feel that I knew these Southern characters at the time. Even though I was surrounded by them, I just hadn't quite been able to make that particular leap. And it was something that Tara taught me. So I really, really want to find Tara again. If you're out there, Tara, if you're listening to this, just please get in touch with me. And I'm sorry that I'm calling you Tara. Uh, I know you would have come up with a much better name. The whole story will go full circle if she shows up. Mm. What do you think it is about Savannah that draws people in? I mean, I actually just visited Savannah for the first time in January on a girl's trip, and I loved it. But I had been wanting to go there for years. I'd read many books set there. I've been to Charleston many times. And I feel like the difference in the two cities, like all of these just true characters come out of Savannah. And I don't feel like you have that quite as much with Charleston. No, I would agree. I don't want to be mean to Charleston, but I think... Savannah feels like a living city to me. Charleston feels more like a tourist place. Savannah has a lot of living industries. And um, for years and years, the creative people have gone to Savannah. It's, you know, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous city. I think it's one of the most beautiful cities in the world. James Oglethorpe, who founded the colony of Georgia and was a brilliant man. But General James Oglethorpe was a real visionary, and he uh, and he laid out the city in this gorgeous way with all of these squares. And, of course, you get all the Spanish moss hanging everywhere. And there's the wharf, and which is still lively, and there's always a sense that things are going on there. There's a, a bit of a tourist district now, which is, you know, unfortunately has just been overrun with ghost tours. But there's always a sense that Savannah has a lot of vibrancy and people really want to live there. And I, while I sometimes think it's the most evil city in the country, I also think it's the most fascinating and the most vibrant. And I feel that I am forever a Savannian. I was thinking a lot about Savannah before this interview because I think it is absolutely stunning. I loved visiting. I thought it was beautiful. I actually did a ghost tour. And I sort of wondered if that dark underbelly and the evil that also exists there isn't the opposite side of a coin. So you have this beautiful city, and if it's going to be so beautiful, then it's going to have the opposite spectrum as well. Sort of like emotions. When you have great highs, you also have great lows. If it was sort of the other side of the coin for Savannah, that if you're going to have these beautiful, gorgeous places, they're also going to have this dark side to them. I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I don't know that there's something necessary. Is there? That's such an interesting thought. You think that the more beautiful the city, the more likely it is that there will be some kernel of evil. It's possible. So I don't know. I was just kind of thinking about that. And I know on our ghost tour, she did talk about 
how much is buried there, literally, you know, right under the the land and how many different things have happened in Savannah and the, the city's checkered history. Yeah. But I just thought that was kind of interesting. I wondered if those things tied together at all. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting thought. I, I always describe that Savannah's deep corruption, it seems to me, started about 10 years after the founding when the settlers that James Oglethorpe brought over, they revolted against Oglethorpe's tyranny because Oglethorpe had insisted that there be no slaves allowed in, in the colony so that the colony began as an abolitionist colony. And um, so these settlers decided that was terribly cruel. And they began to, the sermons uh, at the churches began to campaign for allowing slavery into the colony. And they honestly used the term cruel. They said it's cruel to make white people go out into these fields where they're not supposed to. And I think that is sort of the birth of, of the deep Savannah evil. I feel as though, you know, Charleston w was also a capital of slavery, as was New Orleans, but they started out uh, with slaves. Whereas in Georgia, the, the abolitionist culture had to be overthrown. And so it had to be overthrown with these sermons. And these sermons were filled with lies. And those lies became the lies that the rich people of Savannah used to advance their cause. And so Savannah has always been this place where money, money rules and money is more important than any ethical values. Money creates the ethical values of, of Savannah. And that has continued, you know, for 250 years. I mean, just just about 10 years ago, the sugar refinery on the Savannah River blew up and uh, about 40 people were killed, or uh, I'm sorry, about f 14 people were killed, about 40 people, you know, were seriously injured. And it was because they hadn't been cleaning the sugar off the floor. Just, you know, anybody who works with sugar knows that sugar is uh, extremely volatile. And OSHA had been telling them for years, or for really for almost a century, the federal inspectors had been saying, you have a filthy plant. And they hadn't cleaned it for years and years and years. And so it finally blew up. And somehow to me, that's just, that is very emblematic of Savannah's ethos. Um, Savannah has always been very much about, let's get the money and you know, we'll worry about the rest later. That's why um, the Savannah waterways were some of the dirtiest uh, in the country, some of the most polluted. Ralph Nader actually went to Savannah and wrote about the Savannah water situation, and that's what created the Clean Water Act. He just went in and just looked at the horrible corruption that uh, existed in, in, in the city of Savannah and, and in the county that allowed all of this water pollution so that Savannians, you know, we were, we had so many contaminants uh, in our blood simply from drinking this water and from the kind of effluent that was being dumped into the river for years and years and years. So what I'm saying is it wasn't just about slavery. It continued um, after slavery, it continued after the Jim Crow era. It's, and I think it's still there in Savannah, the sense of the most important thing is money and everything else takes a back seat. And I think that comes through in your book. I'm sure that was one of the things that you wanted to shine through and it did well. Did you plot everything out ahead of time or did you just come up with it as you wrote? How did that work for you? Well, I do outline everything since I write thrillers. I, I feel like I really have to know where everything's going to go. If you want everything to fall into place. But then I'll write a first draft and then somebody will seem, uh, often I'll have a character that I just really, really get interested in. There was one character in this, in this book called Betty. And, you know, and Betty's a country girl who works for Morgana and sort of exists on a, you know, a diet of, 
of pills. She pops too many pills. She has one of those luxurious Southern accents that <laughs> she takes forever to say anything, anything at all. But I just kind of fell in love with Betty. And so I, so when I went back, I, I started to expand Betty's role. That happens a lot. I just fall in love with one character or another. Or somebody annoys me, and then I don't want to write, write about them anymore. So I clip them. But for the most part, I do have a very stern outline. So you know where the story's going before you ever write. Yeah, I mean, I, I can change it, but it, I generally find that the best rule is to, to know where you're going with a thriller. Because you want, you know, you want to pop all these surprises. And, you know, a thriller, you have to kind of move along. There are, there are going to be people who will be dying along the way. And so you don't want a lot of people to die all at once. You got to have everything has to be in a certain rhythm. And I actually love building the scaffolding of a thriller. If it's well built, then the book becomes a page turner. And the one thing that I love to hear from folks is if they say that the book is a page turner, then I felt feel, okay, then I have succeeded because, you know, that's just kind of a magical thing when you're reading a book and you're so swept up that you don't want to do anything but keep turning these pages. That means you got the pacing exactly right when someone says that. Yeah. Well, the thing that I absolutely love about your book is the stunning cover. So was that the first cover Celadon showed you? Did you have something in mind for the cover? It's by far my favorite cover of 2022. Oh, that's great. We had many different covers. We started out with this cover that looked like a Harlequin romance because it was just, you know, a, a, a scary looking house with one light on. And no, that clearly wasn't it. And, you know, we tried a couple of other covers, but we couldn't find any that really seem to grab the essence of this book, which is a pretty, you know, unusual book with, uh, you know, it's not, it's not easy to encapsulate. And then we went out to a great artist named Will Staley, who came up on his own, you know, he read the book and he loved it. And he came up on his own with this image of a, of a, a rather ponderous looking chair floating in the middle of a swamp, but not floating. It looks like it's sort of there in the swamp, like anyone can go and sit there. And it somehow communicates Morgana and her power, and it communicates the darkness of Savannah. And we just thought it was just gorgeous. Well, I think it perfectly encapsulates the story, and I loved it from the very second I saw it. Yeah, it's just beautiful. Well, what about what you've read that you really liked lately? Well, I have read a book by Matthew Spector, who lives in L.A., and he just wrote a book called Always Crashing in the Same Car. And it's really interesting to me because it's a book that I think it, it's sort of in, the, in this generation that I think the, the moth has something to do with. And that is everyone these days everyone is addicted to the true story. So the the personal story. And fiction has, to some extent, taken a, a bit of a backseat. And that was never my intention in starting The Moth. And, and I don't think, you know, the, the Moth is not, certainly not wholly responsible for that. But The Moth was one of the things that was coming out in the, in the late 90s that I think ha has fed into this this new zeitgeist where stories are, are personal and they need to be true or certainly true-ish. And Matthew Spector is a fiction writer, but he weaves into this book, which is neither novel nor nonfiction, but it's just a really interesting, a sort of a memoir, but also the true stories of Hollywood Hollywood folks who made it big and then sort of disappeared. And mostly he's talking about Hollywood writers, people that we may not know of, like Carol Eastman, who wrote the script for Five Easy Pieces. And it was a huge hit in its time. And she was a huge star. And then she's disappeared. And Eleanor Perry, the great 
also a great screenwriter, also sort of vanished. And Tuesday Well, the 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 actress who had been just you know this powerful actress, but was sort of eaten up by drugs and fame and everything that Hollywood does. So at any rate, he he mixes all of this in with his own his the story of his own feeling of dissolution and um and it makes for a just a really beautiful and completely creative mix neither novel as i say nor non-fiction matthew specter always crashing in the same car i love that title and that sounds like a fascinating book i've not heard of it and i'm going to definitely have to look it up it sounds like it'd be an intriguing read yeah it's great well, George, thank you so much for joining me today on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. I can't wait to listen to the episode of The Moth about Tara, and I can't wait for everybody to read The Kingdoms of Savannah. Thank you so much, Cindy. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. Tell all of your friends about the show and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words, a podcast that presents the unvarnished, unsanitized truth of what we have asked of those who defend this nation. As a country, we need these stories more than ever. Stories from Americans who have borne the battle, including 30-year-old remastered interviews with veterans from World War I recounting their time in the trenches of Europe, and with veterans from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and from our most recent conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other battlefields Americans may never have heard of. Hear their stories by listening to Warriors in Their Own Words wherever you find podcasts.